Um, with me right now is Claire Pearsall. She's the conservative councillor for New Ash Green, which is a village in Kent in England. She's also, as part of the Seven uh, Oaks District Council, uh, she's also a, a former special advisor to the Minister for Immigration in Westminster. Um, I just want to welcome you, Claire Pearsall, to this edition of the Politocrat podcast today. How are you? I'm good, and thank you very much for having me. I've been watching your uh, cast with interest. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I have to, I've got to say, um, before we even start, obviously, we've just had a major election here in the United States. And uh, as uh, someone who myself is a British expat, um, I just wanted to ask you, as a fellow Brit, um, how do you view the election here? It's been really, really interesting to, to watch what's going on and to hear the stories coming out. Now, normally US elections would go past most British people, but I think this one in particular, given the character that you've got with the outgoing President Trump and with President-elect Biden, I think people have become really interested in populism, in democracy, and especially with what's going on at the moment in America with the Black Lives Matter movement and gun control and all those different lobbies. I think people are now interested to see what happens over in the States and how it reflects on the United Kingdom because we are closely related. There is a special relationship and it, it does matter. I think what is also interesting is legal action. Now, as you know, British people would not even consider taking that to court. They have over a referendum, but not over a general election, which is the same as your presidential election. So I think that's quite interesting to see where President Trump goes next and how successful he's going to be. I, I, I can't imagine, and I'm thinking back over the last maybe 50 years in UK politics, that you've ever had a situation like this. And I know the systems are different. Um, there's a parliamentary system, there's, you know, and people are voting for their local MP, member of parliament. But yeah. can you remember anything akin to this in, in British political history um, where someone's been so obstinate in terms of, you know, vis-a-vis -vis President Trump in, here in the US? I hate to use the word president, but, you know, <laughs> has anybody been so obstinate like that in your political memory? <laughs> Certainly not in my political memory. Now, we do have um, what we consider to be arguments and, and the referendum in 2014 over Scottish independence brought up a lot of argument as to the rights and wrongs of a referendum and the decision making. But it certainly has not gone as far as the problems that you're experiencing over in the States. Um, our leaders are chosen differently in, in the States. You choose your president, whereas we elect, as you say, a local member of parliament. So it is very, very different. Um, but no, I think this is something I've never seen before. And I think this is what's called people's imagination and why people were glued to American news channels throughout the beginning of November, which has never really caught on over here, only for those in politics. But, you know, members of the public who I wouldn't expect have told me all of their views that they've seen on television. <laughs> you, you know, Claire, what, <laughs> Claire, what is, what I find fascinating as we talk about the U.S. is what we're seeing in our native country it, it, with, with the Johnson government or the Johnson administration or Boris Johnson and Tory government right now. There is, I think, unprecedented levels of chaos in it. I, I just can't. I mean, look, back in the 60s, I just, you know, Harold Macmillan, the Profumo Affair, which really did, um, you know, that was really a thing that shook up a lot of people um, that I can remember. But what is going on? How do you assess Boris Johnson and the situation with the pandemic? Uh, and what I mean is this whole thing with the mayor in Manchester, there doesn't seem to be a very coherent plan. Um, they're back and forth between them and just the general administrating of day-to-day -day things. We had what happened with Sir Keir Starmer who had challenged uh, Boris Johnson in the House of Commons a few days ago, a few weeks ago, about reinforcing this lockdown or I forgot how he termed it. 
And Boris Johnson basically laughed him out of the House of Commons, said that it was ridiculous. And now he's had to institute this current lockdown or however it's called now, that's gonna go on until December 2nd. Can you talk a little bit about the Johnson, uh, Boris Johnson and what's going on right now? I, th I think to unpack that a little bit is that the pandemic is something that nobody could see coming. So let, you know, let's put that out there. And we, as a government, had to look at very carefully how you protected people. So that as a premise is fine. I think where it started to unravel and go wrong was the messaging. The communication out to the general public was confused. It was a case of, we know there's a virus, but it's not over here. So we don't really have to do anything. When all the reports and all the science was showing us that it was coming our way, we did have cases, people were going to die. So I think we were very late to the party. Um, the communication within Parliament, again, was confused, it was authoritarian, it didn't allow for debate, and that got a lot of people's backs up. Politicians will talk endlessly about absolutely any subject, but with these matters, I think you need to have that, you need to have that debate. Each member of parliament is responsible for in excess of 80,000 people, which I know in the States, you know, that's nothing, that's small fry. But to us, this is enormous. And to be able to tell people what they can and can't do is very difficult when you don't know. We were reacting as, you know, I work with a member of parliament, we were reacting on a minute by minute basis to people's problems without having any of the backup from central government, which puts you in a really difficult position. You don't know whether somebody can go around and see their friend, their mother, their elderly relative. You don't know if they can go to a shop or if they have to stay home or if schools are going to close and schools close really late. So we had so many problems that we were trying to deal with and the messages were not filtering out properly from the top. So I think that was your first problem which then seemed to just get worse. And I wish it was a different story, but having to deal with it, having to deal with citizens who were trapped overseas, who were told to leave wherever it was they were on holiday or visiting family, they must come home. Well, that's fine as a message, but how are you gonna get them home? Because the airports have closed, foreign governments have closed their own airspace, they have their own restrictions in place. What do you do with people? So that was very tricky. So dealing with government departments was really quite awful. Uh, I spent many hours on the phone to the Foreign Commonwealth Office, as it was at the time, trying to get people back from India, from Peru, from the United States, from Australia, from, you know, Mozambique. That was one of the other places. And you are just banging your head against a brick wall. So I think that's a real problem. His method of leadership is that he wants to be everybody's friend and he wants to do the right thing and i truly believe he does want to do the right thing but sometimes being the leader of a country and the leader of a party means that you have to make some really unpleasant decisions and you have to say some really unpleasant things and lockdown number two is a prime example i think that his pride got in the way so Keir starmer had stated it was a, a fire break i think he called it a circuit breaker for a couple of weeks which the Prime Minister said, no, that's ridiculous. You know, two and a half, three weeks later, the country's on lockdown once more. So I think he doesn't like to be told, he doesn't like to not be anybody's friend. But unfortunately, that goes with the job. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I laugh, Claire, because it... <laughs> It is really, in some ways, because I do watch this from afar here, it yeah. is honestly sometimes like you're watching this car, car wreck in slow motion because, <laughs> I mean, I don't understand something. And I, and I don't know if you understand either because when we're watching this, this is a majority, an 80-seat majority that happened December of last year. And... Did people, I mean, this is a really impossible question to, to answer, I guess. So it's unfair to pose it to you. But do people really understand what they've got themselves into? Do you think when people voted that they had a sense? 
<laughs> knowing what they knew about Boris Johnson and we look, I mean, time is short and precious. So I'm not going to lay out the 35 years of <laughs> Boris Johnson here. <laughs> People no, can research I, I, that. I, I do think that's, you know, it is an interesting point. And I think if you look back to when the election was, you know, 11, 12 months ago, the world was in a different place. And all his manifesto really stood for was Brexit. Get Brexit done. So the people that had not normally voted Conservative turned out to vote Conservative, and hence why we have an 80 seat majority, largely one in the northern half of the country, where some, in some places we had never ever held a certain seat. Well, you know, and this is down to Brexit, and it was down to Labour's position on Brexit which you know, wasn't clear or concise in any way, shape or form. So that was why people voted. They voted for him because he was saying what they wanted to hear. He was saying he would honor the referendum, which is what they felt the former Prime Minister Theresa May hadn't done. And that's what they were putting their hopes towards. Nobody could see that other than Brexit, anything else was going to happen so it was all okay he could deal with that and he was good and you know he can stand up and he can give an you know an amusing speech but then the pandemic comes along and the financial fallout of that and i think people are now reassessing whether they feel he is able to deal with issues that are really quite important and it's going to take some real tough love to people because the money that has been given out in the furlough scheme which is a fantastic scheme but this is going to have to be paid back and what i think people will not be accepting of is that the potential for taxation increases increases in in other sort of minor taxes if you like sort of capital gains tax which you know will mean nothing to an american audience but this will be on properties on selling properties on inheritance and that starts to hit the core voters normal of the tory party so i i don't understand how he's going to deal with that without making some unpleasant decisions. Now, you know, we've got a chancellor in at the moment who has proved to be very good and very clever, but his experience is not huge. He was a junior minister before he became chancellor. So I do worry slightly that we've got a bit of an uneven keel here with all of the personality on one side with Boris Johnson and a relatively inexperienced cabinet sitting behind him. And you know, you just anticipated my next question. I was going to ask you about the Chancellor Rishi Sunak. It's incredible. I was like te telepathy because I honestly, that was my, <laughs> I was lining, <laughs> <laughs> I was literally going to, I was lining up that next question for you because I'm going to ask you about him. Um, because as you mentioned, he's fairly junior. You know, we know that uh, uh, Sajid Javid was the prior Chancellor. Um, he got fired and, and all of that, and or he walked out, was sacked, or whatever it was, res resigned, whatever. And now Rishi Sunak has been there for, I don't know, the better part of almost a year now. I'm not quite yeah. sure. Um, how would you assess him? Because I've seen you know people on both sides, uh, various sides of the political uh, spectrum, or many areas of it. Some criticize him, think he sloganeers a bit too much. Others think that he's much more substantive and has actually done something. I know he had that great program. I forgot what it was called to do with the restaurants that apparently has not necessarily gone as perfectly as it could. Can you yeah. talk about him? Because I wonder if he's in line, perhaps, for that job at number 10 after Boris Johnson. Is there that possibility? Do you think that that's something that's a possibility? Yes, I absolutely do think it's a possibility. I mean, we as a, as a Conservative Party are quite brutal when it comes to leaders. Once we have decided that they have outstayed their welcome, we do get rid of them. We, we, we you know, we're quite proud of that. And we have a, a position that, you know, if you aren't going to be any good, you'll go. Now, I think Richie Sunak is a very clever, very thoughtful individual. He's also, you know, relatively young. So, that has its benefits. Um, I think that normally you would want your chancellor to have some, you know, banking experience, some city experience, insurance, accountancy, you know, those kind of things, and to be a little, a little older and a little bit more advanced in your career. However, we need some alternative thinking now to reboot the economy, and I think he's got that. So it was the eat out to help out scheme, That's it. which during August uh, was a fantastic 
success, it's not going to solve all the problems. And it probably created a lot more, yeah, many more problems than we thought it was going to. I don't blame him for trying. And I thought it was very clever. And we need more thinking like that. And I think he is definitely the chap to do that. I would like to see him put his hat in the ring for leadership when there comes a time. But I think he's going to have to prove himself making some really uncomfortable decisions before the rest of the party will then, you know, fall behind him. And what you have to understand is you have to have the support of a certain number of members of your own colleagues to get on the ballot paper in the first place. So it doesn't matter quite so much um, some party members like myself or the general public. It doesn't matter in the first instance what we think of them. He has to go out to his colleagues and prove that he can do the job. I think the branding exercise has been really interesting. Okay. He has sorted himself out a particular brand, a particular look. You know, he's been delivering food at tables, you know, in restaurants when we could still do that. You know, I know you take your hat off to him it's very slick it's very managed and very impressive but i think on the flip side for colleagues they need to understand that he can be hard and um unpopular because that is going to be the real crux of the matter if he can stand up to that level of scrutiny then i think he's in with a chance a couple more things i wanted to ask you um one of them um <laughs> is about <laughs> Dominic Cummings. I don't know how much you would really like to talk about Mr. Cummings. Uh, <laughs> so uh, obviously your discretion on how you're going to respond to it. <laughs> because in about well, six yeah. weeks, I'll be popping some champagne. I'll be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> you're not alone. You're not alone. <laughs> so could you, could, you, could you talk about him now? Because we know now that he is going to be on his way out. And a lot of people, including many conservatives, have spared no uh, blushes about it. They have been very frank about it. I was watching Sky uh, News, and um, I forget his name now, but um, one of the lords, um, I believe, or someone had made it very, Sir Roger, I don't know whom. Oh, um, Sir Roger Gale, the MP for, for North Thanet. Yes, thank he was you. very, very forthright. <laughs> oh, he did. <laughs> He made it very clear how he felt. So can you uh, talk a bit about uh, Mr. Cummings and uh, where you might stand on, on, on him and the news of this departure that's coming? Um, uh, where do you start? Um, I, I think that you're not alone in celebrating in six weeks' time uh, that he is gone. I am waiting to see the detail of quite how he will leave. You know, it's all been put out that he will leave, but will he still have an advisory role? I worry that he won't be in post as a permanent individual, but that he will have some kind of influence over the prime minister in a consultancy type basis. I worry about that because I think you either need to remove him as a whole. You can't have a mix and match approach. He's a very divisive character, and I think it's useful to understand he's not a member of any political party, certainly not the Conservative Party. So he doesn't have those interests at heart. He's never, he's, he's worked within Parliament. He was obviously a special advisor to Michael Gove, but he has never worked alongside an MP and their constituency. So he doesn't understand that the public have a really big hold over that member of parliament. Quite obviously, we rely upon those people to turn out and vote. So you have to help. You have to be collegiate with them. You, you know, there's a lot of the stuff that you have to do, which I don't think he understands. He also doesn't understand that in Downing Street, you have to work with the parliamentary party. You can't just dismiss them as irrelevant or moaners or, you know, whiners, which is what he's called a number of people. You can't do that. And, you know, to have the rule of, I will sack you if, uh, you know, you say something I don't like, well, ruling by fear never works. You know, this isn't a dictatorship. We are in a democracy, whether he likes it or not. So I think, you know, he's put a lot of people's backs up over a long period of time. Um, I think he also went incredibly wrong with his trip in April to uh, Barnard Castle in Durham. And I think that was a turning point for people that maybe had never heard of him before. 
suddenly went, well, well, hang on a minute, who is this person? Why can he break the rules? He's the one with the Prime Minister's ear. Well, you know, what's going on? And trying to, to you know, protect him from that was impossible. Especially with people like me that came out there and said, no, he has to go. And I think I called for that sometime in April. <laughs> so I might be getting my wish for Christmas. So, you know, yeah. there, is a, <laughs> there is a benefit to us all. But, uh, you know, you can't defend these kind of actions. And when your advisor becomes the story, it is time to go. We were always told that. You should be in the background. You should do your job. You're not seen on camera. You're not gossiped about. You keep in the shadows. And that's what he's not done. And, you know, I think it's been a real judgment of error of the Prime Minister to have so many of those characters around him as his core team. And, yeah, and then, of course, Lee Kane this week and what happened there. Oh, my goodness me. And uh, I think Carrie Simons had, had intervened as well or at least advised um, uh, the Prime Minister. Uh, Carrie S uh, Simons, for people who don't know, is, I believe, the fiancé um of the prime minister uh, i'm not quite 100 percent sure you can correct me on that claire if i'm wrong um and um but yeah she had gone involved as well i mean there seems to be a lot of disarray um but speaking of disarray the last thing i wanted to, to ask you about and you did allude to it earlier is brexit i mean the deadline's coming <laughs> yeah i mean you know and 2020. <laughs> I, I, I honestly, this, I, I, I mean, there is a no, this is a, a the, the iceberg is called no, no deal, isn't it? I mean, it at is. this point. Yeah. 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 And, you know, 2020, the year that just keeps on giving. And <laughs> with, the, with the deadline is approaching, you have, you know, hopefully a new president to be installed in the United States who will have to negotiate a trade deal with us. And, you know, we can all see that your president is not sworn in until January, which is after the hour right deadline. And so President Trump may have, you know, made the right noises, but, you know, largely this decision is not going to be his for much longer. Fingers crossed, not much longer. And we wait for Joe Biden to, to tell us how he's going to interact with us. And I think that's really tricky. So on the one side, you've got trade deals, which are not signed and sealed. On the other side of it, you've got the potential that the European Union are just going to keep their position and we will end up in a no deal scenario. Having worked dealing with no deal uh, from the Home Office, it's a frightening prospect. And this was even two years ago when I was looking at the impact that it would have on ports, on airports. And this doesn't take into account the pandemic. But when you're looking at the county of Kent, where the majority of your road traffic will come off of the port of Dover, and travel up the motorways to distribute, you know, goods throughout the country, that is going to become a car. It is going to be bought. And I, I can't see how else this is going to work. And there has not been enough thought as to what we do in a no deal Brexit. We did think about it under Theresa May. She made us all go away and have a look at No Deal Brexit, and we all did. Each department had meetings on it. That stopped as soon as Boris Johnson came in because he was determined to get Brexit done. So I think we're in a really tricky position that we only have a matter of weeks left before the deadline, and nobody is ready for this. Businesses have been told to prepare themselves, but not for what? They've had to prepare for a deal. They've had to prepare for no deal. They've had to prepare for something in the middle. They don't understand what customs forms are going to be required for transporting of goods and people. They haven't been told the visa requirements for bringing in staff from the European Union, which they would normally be able to do under free movement. Well, that was going to change, but we've not really been told how that's changing. And you look at the problem that you're going to have with the new immigration system that's just been underpinned in legislation and the likes of employing people to work in care homes, to work in hospitals. So they aren't considered to be um, high skilled, so therefore they don't meet the required uh, criteria for a visa. But we are in desperate need. We take over 120,000 members of the European Union to come and work in our care homes 
to come and work in our hospitals in auxiliary positions. To me, they're very, very skilled people. I couldn't do these jobs. I really couldn't. I couldn't drive an HGV lorry. You know, that it's just things that are out of my control here. And I do worry that we are going to put up barriers unnecessarily and we are going to suffer as a nation because of the stubbornness, as I see it, about Brexit. Um, I supported Brexit in 2016 and I still do. However, I don't think that what we've got is in going to be in any way beneficial to the nation. And I, and I want to just, um, just ask you one last thing. What are you hearing, if anything, from constituents? Because, I mean, this, this is going to make the UK weaker. I mean, this is going to, in my, <clears throat> excuse me, in my view, it's going to weaken a lot of things about the UK. I think in infrastructure and what you've just talked about in terms of needing people who come in and fortify the service industry and the in and parts of infrastructure. You know, will we go back to the NHS and then the birth of the NHS and in the 1950s you had people um, from the Caribbean coming, black black residents coming in and really helping to rebuild after World War II. Uh, very, very important. And now you've got Brexit, which could, I mean, if this goes the way it does, I am very concerned, Claire. And have you heard anything from, from your constituents um, about any of these affairs? Yeah, you do. You still get people um, who don't want it to happen. So, you know, fine. It is happening and we all have to put that to one side. But then people are worried. Local businesses are worried if they, do, uh, if they trade with the United, uh, um, with uh, the European Union. So they, they worry about how their business is going to survive. They worry about tariffs being imposed, that they don't know what they are, so they can't budget and forecast correctly to see what their needs are for capital expenditure, for example. So yeah, a lot of people are concerned about uh, food safety and food standards and animal welfare. You know, it, it's an endless list and it's the knock-on effects of not having anything decided. And the pandemic, I think, has brought home to people that as a nation, we are not resilient enough to have food ready to go for every eventuality. We used to be a nation of farmers and that has you know, gone by the wayside. A lot of that is down to technological advances and people wanting different things, etc. But I think we've lost that ability. We've also lost the ability to cook. So I'd like to put that straight out there, that we all rely upon takeaways and food that is very quick and very easy. And I think the pandemic has shown us that we need to scale back and perhaps live a lot cleaner and a lot better and a lot greener. But if the products aren't going to be available, what are you going to do? So I think that is the majority of people's concern. And with the advent of the vaccine, which I think we are all very excited about, a potential vaccine vaccine for COVID-19 would be an enormous success. How are we going to get that when it's coming from Belgium? You know, if we have a blockade at the ports, that's going to stop medical supplies coming into the United Kingdom. So unless they've got some real quick, bright idea of getting that through, that's another thing that we need to be worried about. Now, that's only just come up on my radar because I was reading uh, some pieces of information about it. But I think when, when general public has a look at that then they will start to really question and be really quite aggressive as to what the answers are going to be and that's where we need the prime minister to step in and actually tell us what the plans are well i i totally am with you on that i, I mean because <laughs> I, <laughs> I am so concerned about this and i'm here i mean yeah. so i can only imagine what it must be like for you and constituents and people across the uk uh, i mean i just hope voters don't have short memories. I just hope that they don't. <laughs> oh, these things do actually hold over. It's quite interesting when you look at it. So, I, you know, I think that some things will never be forgiven and that will show up. And we have local elections next year in May. So that will be a really interesting time to have a look and see what public opinion is doing. Pretty much every parliamentary seat will have a local election or a police and crime commissioner or a mayoral election. So that will be really interesting. And I think that will give you the direction of travel. Right. And, 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 and would you be part of those elections as well? Are you up for 
election as well again no no thankfully <laughs> thankfully mine was in 2017 so i'm safe for another couple of years <laughs> great <laughs> well it's been really wonderful speaking uh with you speaking to you today uh claire pearsall uh, the conservative councillor it's just uh, really wonderful thank you for giving me your time today here on the political podcast it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much thank you very much <laughs>